In this video, we are going to be taking a look at a special type of German projectile known as Meiningeschoss, examining its purpose, function, and success. Now, to fully understand the German use of Meiningeschoss, we have to go way back to World War I. During that conflict, aircraft were primarily made of fabric-covered wooden frames, with their power plants and other essential equipment often being left exposed or unarmored. These aircraft were generally armed with modified machine guns that were originally developed for ground use, such as the MG-08, Lewis gun, or Vickers gun. Advancements during the interwar years introduced aircraft designs that could not reasonably be combated by the dual machine guns of most World War I era designs. This necessitated the development of larger caliber armaments that could more reliably take down modern aircraft. Germany's first design of this type was the MGFF. The MGFF, which stands for Maschinengewehr Flugelfest, was based on the 20mm Ehrlichen design. High explosive and armor piercing 2cm ammunition was available for this gun. However, during testing, not everybody was satisfied with the results. The destructive effect of the high explosive rounds was deemed unsatisfactory. Additionally, the MGFF had a relatively low rate of fire and extremely limited ammunition capacity. Only 60 rounds per gun, so every hit had to count. Here we have a cross-section of a standard German 2cm high explosive shell. These were produced from a forging that was drilled out to accommodate the explosive compound and tracer. Normally, the purpose of a high explosive shell is to distribute shrapnel, and these did that about as well as you could expect from a 2cm or 20mm projectile. The walls of it are nice and thick, and there's a good bit of metal between the explosive and tracer compartment. I certainly wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of one of these fragments. However, aircraft, particularly those of the large, multi-engine variety, didn't really care much about the fragments. Those just punched little holes in the aluminum skin, with much of the real damage coming from the initial blast itself. Of course, enough hits with a 2cm high explosive shell would bring a bomber down, but you also have to consider the slow rate of fire and limited ammunition capacity of the MGFF. So the Germans needed to develop a projectile that was more destructive, but also conformed to the design limitations of the existing MGFF guns. And this is where Meiningeschoss comes in. Meiningeschoss projectiles were drawn out of a single piece of high quality sheet steel. This process of gradually using different sized dies to form the projectile is very similar to how cartridge cases are made. The projectile can now be made much thinner than its predecessor while still remaining structurally sound. More importantly, a whole lot more explosive could be packed inside. So let's look at some numbers, sticking with the example of the MGFF, now modified for the new projectiles and called the MGFFM. A normal high explosive shell had a capacity of around 4.4 grams, which was normally about a half and half mix of high explosive and incendiary compounds. The projectile as a whole, fully loaded, weighed 115 grams. Meiningeschoss, on the other hand, was able to hold a whopping 20 grams of pure high explosive, but the projectile as a whole was lighter, only weighing 92 grams. Now enough of that, let's take a closer look at a couple of my Meiningeschoss projectiles, and I'll point out what makes them special. So right here we have a few of the Meiningeschoss cartridges from my collection. These two are for the MG15120, and this is for the MGFF. You can see how it has that rebated rim, which is one of the features on all MGFF and FFM cartridges. Now to give you a better visual of what I was talking about when describing the construction and design of this cartridge, I have this handy cutaway right here. So let's remove our projectile. And you can see just how thin those walls are because again, this was drawn out like a cartridge case from a flat piece of steel. There's no weld marks or seams. It was gradually stamped with different sized dies until this came out. There's no tracer cavity at the bottom. It is rounded off. We have our copper driving band right here. And if we remove get the fuse out, you can see how the threads for screwing in the fuse are actually a separate piece that has been pressed in because these, these walls here, they're too thin to cut the threads directly into them. And we have some markings on this, but I'm gonna show you the markings on some of these other projectiles. But now let's look at this one, which is completely intact. It hasn't been sectioned. So you can see that rounded off bottom there. And this one has some very nice markings on it. The yellow, which means high explosive. The green band at the top, which means it's self-destructing. And the self-destruct mechanism on these 
was actually accomplished uh, in the fuse itself instead of on uh, rounds like this, where when the tracer burned all the way through, it ignited a secondary detonator, and that's why there's that hole. That's why you can see through it. But since these didn't have a tracer, they used a special fuse that accomplished the uh, self-destructing instead of using the tracer. It would detonate on its own so that there wasn't the danger of it ending up in some farmer's backyard and blowing something or someone up that it wasn't intended to. As for inked markings on the body, we have an M stamped in there, and there, which stands for Meinigeschoss. Not all of them have the M. You'll see some with it and some without. We also have a Luftwaffe inspection mark, 1942 date, and some manufacturer and lot number information. There's our copper driving band on this one. Now finally, we have probably the most beautiful example of a mining Schoss cartridge I have ever seen. Look how gorgeous the yellow paint is, and we have the green. On this one, it's almost more of a teal-colored ring at the top. It tells you it is self-destructing. And this is a very late 1945 dated cartridge. There is no M on this one, but it would be in a case that was labeled mining Schoss when it was unloaded. And you can look at the cartridge and tell by the special type of fuse uh, and other features that it is mining a shot. So there wouldn't have been any worry about confusion, really. This one actually has a steel driving band. Again, late in the war, steel cased. Sorry for that little clicking. There's a, there's a nut inside here to show that it has been deactivated. I didn't put it in there. The guy I bought it from did. This one, unfortunately, doesn't come out of the case. Once it was deactivated, it was put back in and recrimped. Another thing you'll notice on this one is the overspray onto the cartridge case here. You'll see that a lot on late war, uh, larger caliber ammunition. So the Luftwaffe seemed pretty happy with the performance of Meinigeschoss, and every other MG or MK that came after the MGFF had a Meinigeschoss loading available for it. The MK-108 in particular pretty much exclusively used Meinigeschoss. The British later on performed a number of tests with the MK-108 loaded with Meinigeschoss cartridges, and well, the results speak for themselves. I'll put up some pictures from these tests so that you can see what I mean. It was reported that it only took a couple of hits from a MK-108 to completely sever the wing of a bomber from the rest of the aircraft. Of course, Meinigeschoss was not without its downsides. The lower weight of the projectile meant that it flew at a reduced velocity compared to its high explosive counterparts, regardless of the type of gun or cannon it was fired from. Obviously, it didn't really have any armor-penetrating capabilities, and there were circumstances where regular HE was preferred over mining gashos. Often, a belt of ammunition would be filled with a mixture of different types of cartridges, including high-explosive, armor-piercing, mining gashos, and incendiary. What the belts were loaded with depended on a number of factors, such as pilot preference, unit policy, mission considerations, and of course the ever-present issue of supply. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this short video about mining gashos. I know in it I kind of glossed over the different MGs and MKs I mentioned. I tried to keep it as concise as possible and just focus on the mining gashos projectile. In the future, I plan to do more in-depth videos on each of these individual weapons, sort of in the style of my Flak 38 ammunition video, so stay tuned if you would be interested in those. Anyways, I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching.